Hi, everyone. My name is Aisha Creary, and we are back with another episode of Postgrad with Aisha. So today I want to, we're in this video, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about fee split. So, so many people go back and forth around, is the fee split too high? Is it not low enough? Um, from a practice in perspective. And I kind of want to talk to um, newly licensed clinicians or even LPC associates that are working with a private practice. And I want to kind of break down the fee structure or the pay structure that most practices offer and why that happens. So before we jump into that, I am going to just kind of introduce myself for those of you who are new. So again, my name is Asia Creary. I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas and in the state of Missouri and an approved supervisor in both states. I currently have a small private practice in the central Texas area called Crave Counseling. I am a mentor. I am an educator. I am a trainer. I am consultant. I am a program development um, person. I'm all the things you can think of in regard to what I chose to do with my license and my career. Oh, and I'm still a school counselor, uh, a licensed school counselor here in the state of Texas. So let's talk a little bit about why private practices go the fee split route versus a salary or a set amount each week, which would probably be salary. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a lot that goes into running a private practice, especially if you have a brick and mortar location. Now, if you don't have a brick and mortar location, it could look a little bit different, but the vast majority of private practices that have a brick and mortar, which means that they have an actual facility that clients can walk into, regardless if you serve clients virtually or not. The things that go into operating a private practice definitely includes a lot of costs that go into it. So when the toilet breaks, you don't have to worry about it. You just show up to work. Well, there's a cost associated with that. When the internet goes down, you're the, you're not the person responsible for those things. So you just kind of want to keep those things in mind that it takes a lot to run a private practice in addition to furniture, in addition to electricity, in addition to making sure that the facility is clean, making sure that everything is working, changing out air filters, um, having someone come in once a year to make sure that the AC is working, especially if it's in the Texas summer heat. There's a lot of things that go into the costs behind running a private practice. And those things add up really, really fast. Now, the other reason why a lot of private practices operate on a fee split is because it's not agency based. And what that means is there is no federal funding and there is not any money set aside to make sure that these clinicians get paid, whether they provide the service or not. I.e. that also means that if a client does not pay, the practice doesn't generate revenue. So. Typically, if you're on a salary, you get paid regardless if you're working or not, whether it's you see one client that week or whether you see 10 clients that week, you have a set salary. Or if you're seeing 60 clients a week, um, it just kind of depends on where you work at and what that looks like for you. So from a business perspective, there's typically a lot of losses included in paying someone W-2. The other thing that I want to touch on when it comes to W-2 um, based employees is that a lot of people don't realize that the company has to also pay into company taxes. There's employer taxes. If they offer any benefits such as health insurance, such as um, a 401k or a um, IRA account, the company has to typically match a certain percentage if clients or sorry, if employees tend to opt into those things. So Again, there's a lot of costs. And if there is no government funding to help cover those costs, the practices won't thrive and they can't survive. So this is why you will see that most private practices do a fee split or a set fee per client that is seen. OK, so the first reason is it's expensive. It takes a lot to run a brick and mortar. It takes a lot to buy materials, to buy equipment, to make sure that the staff is trained, like all the things in between. And then on the flip side of that, there's a lot that goes into, you know, employer taxes, employer fees, um, the back end stuff, making sure that 
the business is operating and also just additional expenses that most small um, small private practices just can't they just can't afford and then on top of that the practice doesn't generate revenue if there are no clients so or if the client chooses not to pay the the facility doesn't make the money and you as a clinician still get paid and the practice doesn't generate money and so what happens is again the business takes a lot of losses so not only are they paying for the furniture the electricity the internet all the things the client didn't pay so the practice is taking a hit and they have to find some somehow some way find the money to make up for what was not taken care of by the client not paying okay um i forgot to include payroll fees and all the things in between but i'll leave that over here all right so let's transition into talking about what typical fee splits you'll see as an LPC associate and as a fully licensed um, clinician um, and why the fees are what they are, meaning what are what is the practice paying for with the remaining amount that you don't get? <laughs> All right. So let's talk about fee split. So fee split is basically where the practice and the clinician agree on an amount or the practice offers the amount and the clinician agrees to accept that amount. And based on any income that is generated by that clinician. So for example, I, well, as I continue to describe fee split, as we get into the breakdown, the typical breakdown, what you're going to hear me say is a number slash a number, or you're going to hear me say two numbers back to back. So in, in for all intents and purposes for this particular video, think practice first and clinician second. So what that means is the practice is going to get the money first and then the clinician is going to get the money second or the practice gets this amount, this number that I say first and the clinician gets the amount, this amount, this number that I say second. So if you are a fully licensed clinician, you will probably see more fee splits on the spectrum of 50-50 split. That's typically where you'll start or that's typically where you'll be. Again, it depends on if the practice is a virtual practice or if the practice is a brick and mortar practice, okay? You may also see 60-40 split or 40-60 split. And then you may also see 30-70 split, okay? So what I'm saying is the practice takes 50%, the clinician takes 50%. Or the practice takes 40% and the clinician takes 60%. Or the practice takes 30% and the clinician takes 70%. So this is your typical range, right? I've also seen some for fully licensed down where the practice takes maybe 65 and the clinician takes, or 55 and the clinician takes 45. So you can also see that as well. So I'm gonna repeat that. Practice takes 50%, the clinician takes 50%. It's, it's just like, the number, think 100, and that's the number we're going to go with as I continue to explain. So if a client pays you, pays the practice $100, you get $50 for every $100 you make. That's a 50-50 split. If we're doing 55-45 for every $100 that you make or generate with that practice, you take home $45 of that $100. If it's 55 practice take home and 45 clinician takes home. For 40, 60, for every $100 that's generated, the practice takes 40% and the clinician takes 60%. Now, again, typically these numbers are based off of how the practice operates. So what that means is if there's a brick and mortar, you're probably gonna fall more so on the 55-45 side or the 57-43 side or the 50-50 side because the practice still has to operate, okay? All right, 
And that's not a guarantee that your clients are going to pay. So keep that in mind. So that's typically what you see for fully licensed. Now, when we get into associateship status, you're probably not going to be making as much as you would as a fully licensed, unrestricted, non-provisional, non-associate clinician. So let's get into practice clinician. How much does a practice make and what does the clinician take? Oh, and I forgot to mention for fully licensed, you'll probably see 3070 as well. Typically, if it's a virtual based practice, because there is no brick and mortar, so the practice can afford to provide you with more income. So again, if you see 3070 split or where the practice takes home 30 and you take 70, nine times out of 10, that's a 100% remote practice. And those numbers are astronomical. The only way that you'll probably see a 3770 split, even if it is a virtual practice, is if that practice is charging two to $300 per session and they are actually getting clients that are paying it. Okay, so I'm gonna put that over there. All right, so let's talk about associates and what numbers you'll typically see. For associates, you're more than likely gonna see where the practice is going to take majority of the revenue. And the reason being is because there's a lot of things that LPC associates cannot do that the practice has to do. We'll get into that later. Um, so for associates, you'll probably typically see a fee split of 60-40, where the practice takes 60 and the clinician takes 40 for every $100 that is made. You may also see 65 35 where the practice takes $65 and you take $35 for every $100 that is made. Okay. And the same for 70, 30, where the practice takes 70 and the associate takes home 30 for every $100 that is made. Now you're going to see less, or you're going to get less of the income because you're an associate. And there are a lot of things that the practice is going to have to do on your behalf. So I'm going to leave that thought or when we transition into the next the next part. Now, there are some practices that does pay per client. So what that means is for an LPC or a fully licensed LPC, LMFT, um, LCSW, you're probably gonna, if you do a fee or a pay per client, you're probably looking around for a fully licensed, anywhere from probably 35 to 55 as a, fully licensed, unrestricted clinician. Now, on the back side of that, if it is a unrestricted, or sorry, a LPC associate, you're probably gonna see where you're probably making anywhere from 20 to 35 per client that you see, or 25 to 35 per client that you see. But you're probably not gonna go beyond the 45 mark you're probably only going to see that for unrestricted clinicians, mostly because they can build insurance and they can generate more revenue. Now, that's not to say that LPC associates cannot generate revenue from insurance based clients. It just depends on the um, operation of the practice. OK, so I hope I've explained private practice fee split, what that means, what that looks like and why companies opt in for that. So you might be thinking, well, why is the practice taking majority of the money or, you know, why, 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 why? So let me actually break down these things and then we're going to do the actual math and then we're going to tell you why. Right. Or we're going to help you better understand why practices typically take more and the clinician takes less. All right. So what is the private practice paying with their split split that they are receiving from you? They are probably paying for the office space. Rent ain't cheap. I'm gonna repeat that. Rent is not cheap, okay? They are probably paying for marketing. So the cost of the website, your Psychology Today profile, those things are not free, just FYI. They are paying for marketing staff. If they have someone on site that updates the website, that posts all their content, that edits the videos, that does the things. You're, they're also probably paying for headshots and any other type of content that needs to be generated for the company in order to get you clients, okay? So I'm gonna put that right there. They're probably also paying for an office admin. This is the person who's typically getting clients scheduled, clients uh, making sure that clients have completed their intake forms, 
These are probably your people who are making sure that they chase down the clients that choose not to pay the fee. They're charging cards and they are separating the conversation between you and a client regarding payment. Okay. Which will make your job a whole lot more ethical. It, not that it's unethical to talk money with your clients, but when I say make it a whole lot more ethical, if you're sitting with a client and they've told you, oh, I went to the Bahamas, I went to the beach, I just spent $200 to get my nails done, I just um, dropped $200 at the strip club, like whatever these clients are telling you, right? And they don't pay your copay or they don't pay the amount that they owe you, you're gonna feel some type of way as a clinician. So instead of you being a part of the money part of it, that's why the admin is there and that's why the admin is so so important because you're going to see that client and then you're also going to feel bad and you're going to be like, okay, well, I guess I can continue to see them and even though I haven't been paid. No, the admin is going to make sure you get paid and if you don't get paid, that client can come back and that's just not a conversation that you have to have with the client. Um, the admin is going to make sure that that's taken care of. There's probably already a script created that's going to say, hey, due to non-payment, we're, you know, we're recommending that um, you seek out these other providers or other organizations that can provide services for free. But at this time, we have to discontinue services, yada, 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 whatever. That keeps you as a clinician from having to do that um, because it, it'll be just your luck. You get that one client that gets upset at the fact that you didn't. Um, grant them grace and they're going to go to the board and say you abandoned them um, and according to our court of, code of ethics we're not supposed to abandon clients but if you have you know an administrative team chasing them down sending them the reminders making sure that they understand their obligation to pay then you're taken care of because there's going to be extensive documentation that states that the company or the organization that you work this is their protocol and these are their procedures and i had nothing to do nothing to do with this client being discontinued that is the procedures of the organization and i was just an employee there all right so that's going to be a cya covering your tail right or cyt <laughs> all right so then let's talk a little bit about other staff that they're probably paying. They're probably gonna be paying a maintenance crew if they have a brick and mortar to come in and make sure that the toilet is working, that the TVs are working, that everything's connected, that whatever they come in here and do. They may also have a cleaning crew that comes in and make sure that the office is clean, sterilized, organized and things. So think about that. The other thing um, that you may they may have staff for is someone who manages the records. So anytime a client does a records request, anytime there is a subpoena, anytime there is um, when you submit your charts, the person that reviews their char your charts, that takes them time to review. And they have to get paid for the time that they take to review those charts to make sure that you're in compliance and to make sure that your charts are ethical. And it includes anything that the board requires you to include in their records, documentation and charting situation. OK. The other part is included with the admin staff is probably going to be someone who does billing and insurance separately or just insurance separately. So if your practice bills insurance on behalf of you as an LPC associate, that is a whole job. Let me tell you, hours sitting on the phone with insurance, hours chasing down claims that didn't get approved, hours fighting with them, resubmitting claims, chasing them down, getting new call reference numbers, verifying insurance, that is a, a whole career in itself, which is why there's a such thing called mailing, medical billing encoders. OK, so I'm going to put that over there. The next thing that the company is probably paying for, depending on the organization, because not all private practices offer laptops and technology. Some you have to show up with your own technology and equipment, but the company may be paying for your laptop. Or they may have paid for it up front and they're paying, you know, and, and it's covering the cost of that. They are probably paying for HIPAA compliant software to be installed on this technology. Um, also, they're paying for the electronic health record system. They're paying for business insurance. They're paying for Internet. They're paying for electricity. They are paying for anything you can think of that has a cost that you use in order to do your job. Typically phones computers or a phone app, computer, um, and the electronic health record system, you know, um, you know, the internet at the office, the cable at, you know, whatever is at the office that they're covering, you're, they're probably 
that's a huge fee and set of costs right there. Again, other fees that most people don't know that the company has to pay, there's processing fees. So anytime that they collect payment or they have to go to the bank to deposit money, sometimes there's a processing fee for some of those things. Now, depositing money, there's no fee, but there's typically a fee that the company loses anytime a transaction is completed through some sort of um, payment card processing system. So keep in mind all of these things when you are having conversations with practices in an interview and when you are working at a practice and you're trying to figure out why can't you get a higher fee split. And then also, if you only see 10 clients, the practice is probably not making a lot of money to make sure that these things are taken care of. They wanna make sure that they give the front office staff raises. They wanna make sure that they can upgrade the furniture at the facility. There's a lot of things that the practice can do to make your experience there better, but they can't do it if you're only seeing two clients, three clients, the practice is not making money. So keep that in mind if you're at a practice and you're like, I wanna make more money, I wanna make more money. Um, I can see that you're bringing in this and you're bringing in that. Well, baby, let me tell you what we pay for at the front office. Well, let me tell you how this works. OK, so just be graceful with the practice that you work for. And if you're doing an interview, just making sure that you understand what goes into operating a private practice and why some practices fee splits are set for what they are. Now, I digress. I hope that this was informational um, and I hope that it is beneficial. And I really hope it just provides insight from a clinician perspective, but also for someone that's like, well, I'm gonna just go start my own practice. Well, baby, let me tell you, it gets real on the other side of the pendulum, on the totem pole, like it gets real on the other side. So just keep that in mind um, as you navigate finding a new job and navigate just the spaces in general. So I hope this video was helpful, um, but yeah. Leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Tell me your experiences. I'd love to see what you guys' fee splits are. Again, we're in Texas, so this is what I typically see. And I hope that this stuff makes sense to you. Until next time.